This is part three of our chapter three video lecture series, where we continue talking about different types of taxable income, in this case related to divorce. So for most people, they think the big topic regarding divorce is alimony. And we'll see in a second, maybe it's a moot point right now. But here it says also property settlements in a divorce may have possibly an indirect effect on your taxes. And also child support, there's probably no direct effect. But it's a very complex situation in the case of divorce and taxes. So I would recommend taking a look at this IRS publication 504 and making sure you're working with the current year version of that publication to get more information. But let's take a look at the three topics here, beginning with um, what they call property settlements. So it's a tax-free transaction when you split up the property among the two spouses. For most people, what they're focusing on is the economic value being allocated among or between the two ex-spouses and making sure they agree to what their fair share is. Again, when you talk about the value in terms of taxes, the, the term we use is called fair, fair, fair market value. Yeah? But now, also you need to consider for tax purposes, what is the so-called cost basis to that same asset that's being divided up between the spouses? The general rule is when you divide up these assets among well, between the spouses, is that it's tax-free. But then, whatever assets they have after the divorce, they start collecting it or selling it, that may cause a taxable situation equal to the value minus the basis. Again, you possibly will have a gain that could be subject to tax. So let's take a look at this example number six here. Tim and Cher, uh, Cher got divorced. And then in this divorce decree, that's the legal work, the paperwork that the court has to approve, Tim is going to give up a home worth 250000 Okay, that's the fair market value. But then the cost basis to Tim is 110000 And Tim doesn't have to report a gain when he transfers this um, property to share. And share doesn't have to report any income upon, again, receiving property in a um, divorce. But when Cher receives the property, this is going to be her cost basis, the same that um, Tim had uh, paid for. So if now Cher sells this home, let's say immediately after getting divorced and getting this property, she has to report a gain of... Uh, the difference here of $140,000. So again, when you look at a property settlement, you're not only looking at the value, the fair market value of what you're receiving, but you're also looking at the cost basis that's going to be also transferred and any potential gain that has to be recognized on the eventual disposition of that property. Another thing here under property settlements that's not mentioned in our book is something called qualified domestic relation uh, order or uh, transferring um, uh, retirement accounts between the spouses. It could be an individual retirement account. It could be an employer uh, sponsored retirement plan like a 401k or even a pension plan. And again, you're looking at the value of what's being transferred. And at that point where you're transferring the amount between the spouses, usually that's tax-free if it's following this uh, quadro rules, uh, the quadro disclosure on the, tax, on the divorce decree. But then, is there any tax basis to that retirement plan that can eventually be uh, distributed tax-free to the taxpayer? Again, you have to be careful here because this is possibly one of the biggest assets um, that most people don't initially uh, look at. Yeah? They look at the home. They look at the automobile. They may, just after the fact, look at the retirement accounts.
Okay, so no immediate effect, no taxable gain or loss when you split up the property, but it may have an effect later on. Let's take a look at alimony. Again, the main thing a lot of people first think about when there's a divorce. So if the divorce took place after uh, 2018, there is no direct effect on taxes. You don't have to report any alimony income you receive, and you don't get to deduct any alimony payments you make. But if the divorce took place before 2019, then possibly the alimony you receive is taxable and the alimony you pay is deductible. Let's take a look at the 1040 form and see where it's reported. Oh, if, if you're divorced or are legally separated at the end of the year, then you're not married, assuming you're not remarried again, yeah? Or, so you're not going to be filing a joint or a separate return. Possibly you're going to be single, or if you have a qualifying dependent, a head of household filing status. Um, let's take a look where you would report alimony income. If you look at the first few lines, you don't see the word alimony here, so probably it's going to be here on schedule number one. And the deduction, if you pay alimony, is also going to be on schedule number one. So let's take a look at schedule number one, here where we have more income items. And here in line 2A is the amount you would report the alimony you receive. But then you also have to write down the date. Remember, to be taxable alimony, the, the divorce or the uh, separation uh, agreement has to be uh, finalized after 2018, if it's uh, well, if it's taxable, it has to be before 2019. If it's after 2018, it's not taxable. You don't have to report it. So you would total up all of this miscellaneous income and then report it back on the 1040 form. Now, if you're paying alimony, that's going to be an adjustment deduction not an itemized deduction, which we'll um, look at later on in the semester, but an adjustment. And let's see, here in line 18A is where you would report the dollar amount of the deduction. In addition to asking you, what is the date of your divorce or separation? Again, it has to be before 2019 to be deductible. You also have to put here in line 18B, the social security number of the ex-spouse that's receiving the alimony payment. So it's kind of cross-referencing here. If you're going to take a deduction, they probably want to make sure that X is also reporting it as income. Okay, so you total up the miscellaneous income, you total up these adjustments, and then it's reported back here on the 1040 form, either as... Um, alimony income, line 7A, or alimony deductible payment in line uh, 8A. Okay, so that's, well, a, a few more rules regarding alimony. It's mentioned here. It has to be a cash payment, monetary payment, and it cannot be for child support. It has to be alimony. And it mentions a few more items down here. But let's talk about child support, payments to the custodial parent by the non-custodial parent. Child support is not taxable when you pay it, uh, when you receive it. And child support is not deductible when you pay it, unlike alimony if, again, it was um, under a divorce decree prior to 2019. But uh, maybe the person who's paying this child support wants to negotiate who can claim the child as a dependent. Remember back in, I believe it was chapter one, when we talked about um, dependents, one category was qualifying child, another is qualifying relative. Let's take a look back on the 1040 form again here. So we see the section here for dependents. 
So the general rule is that the custodial parent or parents will claim the qualifying child or other relative. Again, qualifying child or other dependent relative. And typically, when a dependent is claimed here, let's say under this um, qualifying child, that means there's going to be generally a $2,000 child tax credit or additional child tax credit going to this parent here, this uh, taxpayer. But now the custodial parent can give up the right to claim the dependent to the non-custodial parent. So the non-custodial parent can claim that $2,000 child tax credit or possibly the $500 other related um, dependent if they don't qualify for the child tax credit. That's, again, giving up the right by the non-custodial parent. And it was mentioned back in that chapter chapter one. This is the form that has to be signed by the custodial parent and given to the non-custodial parent. So now that parent, non-custodial parent can claim the credit. Okay, Either you do it by year or multiple years. And then any time that custodial parent can revoke that right to the um, by the uh, non-custodial parent. If you're the non-custodial parent, you gotta attach this form again 8332 to your tax return in the year you're claiming that uh, that um, that child. Okay. So let's stop here. Go ahead and continue with the next video that should be dealing with. The next type of income that's going to be um, distributions from an IRA account.